Um, first, I want to know how many people were, were at my lecture yesterday. Not very many. I ask you all to indulge me if I um, try to bring other people up to speed, will you? Uh, because I don't want to start off from where we ended yesterday. You should have been in the same suspense other than those who were here yesterday to hear the story I was going to tell, but I said, no, you have to come, you have to, come to the next time to hear it. It's a story about the strange career of blood in America today, race and blood in America today. But I'm going to start where I started yesterday to say uh, what the meaning of racecraft and race, what my, the meaning of juxtaposing racecraft with witchcraft is in the work that I'm doing. Here's the book, by the way, and it will be out in paperback next spring. Um, the idea of, of, of drawing an analogy is that um, my co-author, well, co who's a historian, and I consider that what Americans call race and shorthand as race it is, in fact, more complex than the term race implies. Um, and the thing that we could, and we, we think of race in general as physical characteristics of people that they share in groups that are, that are different, and with the key element that the difference is also, onto the difference is added invisibility. And we think that anytime there's something invisible in a phenomenon, it's worth handling uh, according to invisible things. The invisible part of race, by the way, is the hierarchy. You can't read it from anyone's face or anyone's stature. So there's already a part of it that's weird. And to deal with the weirdness, we considered what we call a dead public faith that's dead in the United States, not everywhere in the world. Uh, because witchcraft always deals with invisible things, and uh, it's a dead faith in the United States. Racecraft is a li living faith, it's a living faith in the United States. But neither one is a dumb faith, it's not based on uh, craziness or, or stupidity it, or inability to reason, both neither one, neither witchcraft nor racecraft. They're based on a kind of reasoning that takes shape in great part from the fact that it's dealing with invisible things that can't be helped. And invisible things uh, come into being when you imagine them and give them a name. It means, and that means, that they're not only, in, let's say, a witch. And we give it, it's invisible until we say, and that person is one. So there's the concept of a witch and many things attached to it. And, and there's that. Uh, but in the reading the history of witchcraft trials, we find that it's not only that it's hard to identify who is a witch until suddenly something happens, but the, that the things witches supposedly do are invisible too. And while, are, uh, I'm sorry, the mechanism of the things they do are invisible too. What makes that belief hang for people who have good sense is that there are sudden deaths. There are cows that go dry. There are people who catch asthma. So there's a, there's, a, there's a visible something or other. But the causation isn't on the surface, right? You have, you have that. You have a problem of, of suspended causation so you figure out something, something else. And has everybody seen the Harry, one, the Harry Potter movie in which they race on broomsticks? The broomstick is a symbol of, uh, an emblem of witchcraft. And notice that nobody says, how did they work? There's no mechanics to, the, to that. 
So that's the sort of, we find features like that in what we call racecraft in the most unexpected way. The, the, uh, 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 we found it in what, in supposed science about the uh, matching of blood by race. We found the same kind of reasoning, suspended causality. And so that's where I'm going. That people don't know this, the causality isn't there. And it's not done people. And by and so the living faith is not living because people are stupid or crazy, but because there's a certain kind of reason that they all have, I think, as a species that we are capable of. Um, circularity, assuming what you're trying to prove, and not noticing the fact. That's why teachers have spent years te telling you, marking talk on the side, tautology on the side of your paper. You assume what you're supposed to prove. This, it's built in. We have to unlearn that. This, the, the, they itself, the uh, circular reasoning, is there. And the failure to notice something wrong with it is there in us. And we, we have to get, uh, get rid of it. Now, the living faith we have is subject to it. The dead faith was subject to it. The dead faith, I want to demonstrate because, ah, oh, just because. It's October, and Halloween is coming. <laughs> and Nobody hesitates to handle a broomstick or one of those pointy hats or long-fingered gloves. Inconceivable in the Germany of Martin Luther to have a casual, lighthearted attitude about the paraphernalia of witchcraft. Now, I did, gave a lecture once in October and I passed an image of that around. Uh, before I told them, why didn't you draw back and worry about the consequences of being seen holding it in order to get people to see the point? That's not the case with racecraft. Watch the behavior. Uh, just the small examples, I can multiply them a zillion times. Look at that, the, look at the euphemisms people use nowadays. If they want to say race, they say, quote unquote race, or they do this, that's a hand, superstitious hand signal, and they're frightened of stepping the wrong way. That's the kind of anxiety you have when you're uh, up in an invisible realm where you don't, you know something is about up, but you don't know quite how to put your, your hand on it. It so happens that last year a friend of mine ran into the living faith of, of racecraft at a Halloween party where a group of uh, roommates came in dress, uh, dressed, up, uh, dressed up as characters from a movie called Happy Something or Other about a golfer. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a black character and Lord help, help him. One of those roommates came with his skin darkened and there was at least one person who freaked out and thought, and it wasn't a black person as far as I know, was this racial stereotyping. See what I mean? There was, there was no lightheartedness. Some people had the lightheartedness, some people didn't. And the consequences these days, where the religion is hot and lively, is that there was judicial action and people had to be educated about the meaning of racial stereotyping. So I hope I've made my point. We've got something real and something live that I'm attempting with my uh, sister in this book uh, and in other work that we do to uh, try to understand uh, if, uh, in terms of its mode of life. Um, now, in terms of race, the there is another invisible trait that I try to, uh, another feature, not general invisibility, but something in particular that we call, that is called soul. And everybody can, in everyday language, say every, there's an individual soul. That's invisible, you understand. And it's um, uh, 
yet it's fundamental, and it's, there's something special about sacred, depending on the tradition one is from, but the idea of soul carries all that with it. Now, the idea of soul is the chapter, is the subject of a chapter in the elementary forms of religious life. It's a fundamentally religious idea, but, in the, but it is also a very important, according to Durkheim in this, in, in this book, it's a very important idea that's fundamental to social life. The idea of soul, this invisible thing, makes it possible for people to think cont continuous personhood. Birth to death, somebody is the same person. But, and because every human being comes from other people, there's implied in that individual soul something more extensive. It goes back in time, right, <clears throat> this, as we said, and that crosses, uh, that um, uh, occupies space. It covers more than uh, one person. And, there, and so, for that reason, and you can see how that works together, you don't have any part of it without having all of it, you can see that it is um, a, a useful tool, a, a tool of the mind, for talking about collectivity. And the elementary forms of religious life is totemic clans, clans that identify their um, identify themselves by relationship to an animal or a plant. That term, that notion allows them to say, I am an emu, I am a kangaroo, I am a louse. There are three louse totems in, uh, <laughs> in the society. Um, they know this all of the natural world. That's one way of saying it. Uh, but I'm saying they know this nature around them. But they have uh, brought nature, made room in society for nature. That's another phrase that Durkheim uses as they try to elaborate social life. Now you look at that and you see that it's useful for totems. It's also useful for what we call races. But what's handy for my purpose about what about Durkheim's totemic clans is that a part of what we assume in America drops away. There is no seemingly self-evident collective identity that somebody has uh, that could go by the name kangaroo. So we, watch, we can watch in this book the dynamics of people making something, uh, living within something, that's not real in the mere empirical sense of being a human being and not a kangaroo. And there are many examples there, but we at least can stru stru uh, strip away the idea that race means having brown skin. Well, everybody can see that. But that's not just what race is, and that's certainly not what race craft is. Because racecraft, as I said at the beginning, always has a part that's invisible, and that is hierarchy, the rankings. You all with me? OK. I, I want to make sure you have that, because it's so easy to slip back into what's self-evident. I have a friend, I'll say this aside, who has a very smart husband for a doctor, for a husband. And he took, he read too quickly when he got the book, and he said, well, it's obvious that race is there. She said, yes, honey, it's obvious that race is there, but that's not the obvious thing. That's not what the book is. He completely missed it. It's easy to miss, and it's easy to lose sight of, the point that I made. It's easy also, one imagines, for um, one of the Australians of the, that, in the societies that Durkheim considered to remember that they're a kangaroo. There's nothing about them that will remind them that they're a kangaroo. Nothing bodily. But what can be done, <coughs> and what is done, that they translate that, express, 
simultaneously create that identity through ritual doing. They have celebrations. The uh, men are initiated as kangaroos. <coughs> they are, there are periodic celebrations that is kangaroos and not others. And yet others where, and other celebrations where different clans meet. They wear paraphernalia. Uh, they mark their uh, dress or their undress with painting to identify who they are. And so you see there are constant reminders of something that's contrary to, to empirical evidence. Now, let's not say that is the result of that is false. It's not false. The descent is true. The physical existence of individuals is true. The existence of the group is true. But the idea of soul gives them, uh, so provides a way to see it and keep seeing it, a rationale for it. I speak of that uh, property of soul as its identity program. And if anybody's a philosopher, come up and tell me if I'm going off the, off the rails by saying that. Um, but I mean that it enables people to, esta to establish sameness. We are all kangaroo as, um, as against difference. They are something else without having a physical reference for it. Sameness and difference. And they can also establish, uh, this, the idea can also help people establish um, difference where, we, where you would think there was sameness. And the example I gave yesterday was of Walter F. White, who was the first Negro president in 1920. That's why I use that term of the NAACP. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. And because he had blonde hair and blue eyes, he was well equipped to infiltrate the Klan, Ku Klux Klan. At the time, there were a lot of lynchings. Now, he was at risk at every moment of slipping out uh, culturally in some way. And the risk meant, could have meant, um, that if the risk had been fulfilled, he could have been lynched for pretending to be a white man. See that? It's wild, I hope it's wild. The, the coloredness, the negroness of Walter White was invisible on his face, but real in the sense of his connect, his soul, and the kinship back in time. Uh, as, um, as it was judged uh, in America in, at the turn of the century. By the way, he got, he was made, he became militant, I guess, or began the commitment, or conceived the commitment that helped define his life in the race riots that shook Atlanta in 1906. Klansmen rode into his part of the city. They had they were middle class people. They had a nice house, and the Klansmen were overheard talking about this house is too good for Negroes. They were going to burn it. I don't know what the story is about how that was averted, but he, he, it was a terrifying event. And however he looked, blue eyes and blonde hair or no, he had confronted horrifying violence in his own life based on who he, what his soul was, rather than what his exterior was. Okay. Any questions on that? The soul has characteristics. This I take from Durkheim, and I think Durkheim <laughs> took them from Aristotle and Plato and from uh, other uh, philosophical sources, as well as from the formulations of ethnographers who uh, we're describing phenomena like it. And they usually were talking about that which the Totemic clans claim to share and embody as individuals. Indissoluble. It's all of one piece. And all of one piece, it's the same in all its parts. There's not a different soul in the finger of a person than in the foot. 
one part is equivalent to the whole. You could have only a part of the uh, uh, um, totemic animal for a celebration and have you no know, a kangaroo, suppose you were going to do something with it. Uh, any little part of it would do. As is the case with relics, if you all recognize it, the, the, a hank of hair from St. Radegon is in a big church in Poitiers and up on a big thing. But that's how they did it in the Middle Ages. The same, the principle is the same. And I gave that example of <laughs> the hank of hair from St. Rodrigo. We don't know for sure there was a hank of hair because I don't think anybody has been in it for 1,500 years <laughs> to, know, to know. But um, along the same line, Virginia, in the state I, the state I now inhabit, passed a law in, um, in 1924 called the Integrity of Blood Law that said a person is uh, black if there is one drop of Negro blood. Or maybe Negro would have been the term, one drop of Negro blood. So people like, who looked like Walter White would have been found guilty of a felony under that law uh, if they had tried to marry and their drop of blood had been discovered. Well, this is the same principle as salt. You all with me? Okay, that's... Uh, and people began to think that it was perfectly sensible. So you can understand that uh, why people believed in witchcraft thought that one little toe of newt, as in Macbeth, is enough if it was the right kind of newt. All right. Um, immortal is another one. Immortal speaks to that continuity over time back to the earliest ancestors and forward into the indefinite future. Um, okay, so we... Uh, oh, one other feature. The uh, soul, of course, is invisible. I say it again, I keep saying it. It's immaterial. And besides, but it can it can spread contagiously. That goes with it in many uh, traditions. There are things that can be done with it. Um, and one of the places it can spread to is material objects which give it, I'm quoting Durkheim, a kind of material existence. A kind of material existence. So, um, I su and I think this was one of those one of the principles of, of those relics. The relic is con is containing something of the saint, and if it's healing, you just touch the person, and the saint goes. It's holy present; it doesn't run out completely of the part it came from, um, but it can it, it contact can make it move. But there are many places where, uh, and, you, and it can uh, come uh, and take residence in a physical object, in physical objects of various kinds. But blood is one of the physical objects uh, that blood, that soul takes up residence in. And we know, as we colloquially, Blood is one of the ways people talk about descent, even now, and talk about race, even now. And watch for trouble when people who come with the baggage of that kind of understanding to the scientific study of blood, and in particular, blood transfusion, because all kinds of ancient ideas come to the fore. And to for, give you a for, for, uh, preview, so will the forgetfulness about cause and effect that supposedly science equips you to do. Watch for that when I come to my example, examples. Uh, Durkheim says twice, blood is the soul itself seen from outside. 
if anybody in here has philosophical background, I want to know where that, I'm sure it belongs to one of the ancients, and I have not found it yet, and I want to find it. Okay. Um, moving on, um, I want to, now, I've talked about the contagiousness of soul. I want to talk about other everyday usages that can turn out to incorporate or include these kinds of understandings. Um, there's a, I want, there's a woman who, an influential woman who objected to the fact that Barack Obama identified himself on, a, uh, on the census as being African American when everybody knows he had a white mother, white American mother, and a black African father. And she said, why did he do that? He cannot deny DNA. Now, did she mean deoxyribonucleic acid when she said that? Folks, come on now. <laughs> No. Go! No. no! I don't think she probably would have known how to say it. What did she mean? That he didn't have African American blood. That he didn't? Right. No. 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 That's not what she meant. That's not what she meant? He meant, no. Oh, you mean you think white blood, having white blood could have, to have erased all the rest? No, 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 that he didn't have the proper admixture of actual African-American blood, which is an odd concept in itself. I don't think that's what she meant. Anyway, I have the advantage of having read the context. She meant that he shouldn't say he's African-American if he's that and something else. He can't deny that he has Euro-American blood. So she says, he can't name himself by what he appears to be, and that he has said many times how what he appears to be determined many things about his life. Uh, that I summarized uh, yesterday with um, a, a quotation from W.B. Du Bois, which I might as well give you because it's a delicious one. He says, a black man, and has everybody, anybody ever seen a picture of Du Bois? He's a mixture of everything in the new world, but recognizable at 50 yards as Afro-American. Recognizable as other things close up. But he said, and he was and living at a time when people were in the, in the midst of lots of race talk and race thought, he said, a black man is a person who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. And Obama has responded to that kind of statement by saying, I operate as, I have to go on, gone into what I appear to be, because that's the way it is. That's how racecraft, that's an aspect of racecraft in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> now, so I think I've done, I'm ready to move into action. Last, this is the thought part of my series. That I've just given, I was coming to action today. Um, the action um, is repeated, uh, almost formalized conduct that people do unreflectively. I would call, if you will allow me to call it rites or rituals, I would like to do that because there's a form that recurs and because it's repeated. Um, there, how many of you have read Elementary Forms of Religious Life? Yay! All right. Some, you, he attempts a classification of, of rights, and I'm going to put up a very provisional classification of rights to organize what I have to say about things done. One kind of right is in the business of classification, shuffling people to the categories they belong in. And I'm going to tell you some stories that exhibit that. Second kind 
uh, is uh, sumptuous. Yes. You mean R I T E S, right? For all the students who don't know. This happened yesterday. Right? <laughs> yes, R I T E S. Rituals. <laughs> Thank you. Ritual doing. Very good. Thank you. All right. Sumptuary rules. Rules that say what people can wear, where people can go, and so on that contain that are aimed at distinguishing unequal groups, inequality. One of the examples I have from 1822 occurred in my ancestral state of South Carolina when a group of people went to the um, legislature to ask for the passage of a law to prevent Negroes from wearing lace and um, silk and such fancy stuff as is uh, as, is a, is, as expresses the sense of luxury because they must be made to feel in their dress their inferiority. They were plain about it. Now, you can be arrested for what you're wearing. Now, those rules, rules like that, they didn't invent in the United States. Uh, rules like that were used in Europe where everybody had more or less the same skin color at the 50-yard test. They, would all, they were all white, but not all were born equal. Not until the French Revolution did that concept take hold in the ground. They had sumptuary rules, too, of what you could wear, where you could go, if you were a, a commoner. And they had rules about where, what you must wear and what you must live if you're an, arist, uh, an aristocrat. They, the routine of dress and presentation in the world is part of making those distinctions in both cases. And they, if you start on with sumptuary rules, you, you, you and think uh, that helps me at least organize things. Skip Gates, when he was arrested, as he was trying to go into his apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts by, by uh, a policeman who did not know he was a Harvard professor, uh, got arrested uh, on suspicion of breaking into his own house. Well, this was because it was the kind of neighborhood and the kind of house where somebody who looked like him, uh, from which somebody who looked like him was excluded at least in the general understanding. So he got arrested under sumptuary rules, and those are not legal ones. Those uh, there, he was not re legally restricted from that area. It was just that he, he was an anomaly. <laughs> he got here as an anomaly to the police. So, so you see that worked. It worked with, I, um, I want you to see that that sort of activity is a hand for everybody, available to everybody and to authorities for making distinctions that would not otherwise be visible and capable of being acted upon. So there, there's a sumptuary types of rights, and if you start looking at them, you go, oh, I have one more, um, about food stamps. In 2005 or so, the government this is a little more complex, but I think you'll get where I'm going. The, in about 2005, the government began replace the old food stamp coupons with plastic cards. Are you aware of that? And they started calling it the, sub, the SNAP program, Supplementary, <coughs> Supplementary Nutritional Assistance Program. Now you say, what's up with that? What's up with that, I think, is other people than the uh, undeserving poor were requiring nutritional assistance. And the food stamps would have made them look like too much like those fictional welfare queens of the past who needed food stamps. I, that's a subtle um, thing within that, that, that sumptuary mode that I'm trying to tell you about. 
Um, and I'll tell you a, a story. It's told in the, in the book about driving from, from um, Washington to Rochester once and stopping in one of those deep New York little towns, going to a shabby little store because I had to get something. And nobody, everybody there is white and not well off. And I, I felt, I was, I felt strange there. I felt like I was in the wrong place and I might be punished for it, but my uh, husband was at the wheel outside the store. <laughs> so I went in and I got my stuff and I got up to the front and my eyes bulged because there was a woman, a good sized woman, going into her, white woman, going into her jeans pocket and pulling out a wad, this is in the old days, Food stamps. And my jaw dropped. I had never seen it. And then I thought, good Lord, what are they going to do with me? I come here with cash. Am I safe here? I got very nervous. Perhaps more nervous than I needed to be, but I said, you know, I'm not in I'm not in the right kind of store <laughs> for me. And I and I don't know the place. But you, you see the play of that, and the discourse in the press about that says people use food, uh, food stamps, the welfare queens in the 80s were using food stamps, driving to stores in Cadillacs and using food stamps to buy sirloins. And there was a whole, there was a whole discourse around sumptuary rules and very loaded with um, identifying people racially. And uh, in their, in different places in the hierarchy, according to our national. <laughs> okay, and <coughs> dominance and deference, another pair where you're expect. Oh, by the way, I have a sanctuary one. I'm going to read at the end if I have time from my grandmother who was raised, uh, who lived and died. In in South Carolina have a heck of a story if there's time. Dominance and deference, the expectations in the Old South in little towns that um, inferiors would step off the sidewalk when superiors were coming along. And that went out of fashion. But my daughter was, what, was surfing the net one day in 2009. She said, my God, look at this. The uh, emergency medical, medical trend uh, technician has been attacked by a state trooper. And it's down in uh, Oklahoma, between <coughs> the towns of Payton and Prague, or Prague, I know, P R A G U E. And she said, You got to look at that. And it turned out to be a serious variation of that step off the sidewalk. One. The story was that the, the EMT was driving, was in an ambulance treating a person who had collapsed of heat stroke. And a little detail is that this, the, it belonged to the, uh, the Creek Nation of Tribal Authority. That was written on the back of it. Now, the policeman apparently tried to get, he, he began to chase the ambulance. You can watch this online, by the way. All you have to do is Google um, Oklahoma EMT and chokehold, and <laughs> you will find it. Um, he tried to stop the, uh, he tried to get the ambulance to stop, and the ambulance kept going because it had an emergency patient. And the police finally forced him to stop and started to yell at the driver. Uh, because you didn't stop. You flipped the finger at me. And it, it went on to the point that the EMT who was in the back of the ambulance came out. Uh, he had been treating the patient, the emergency medical technician, the highly trained person. He's not the driver. He came out as he had to and said, Officer, I am in chart black. Black. Officer, it's not black. I forgot that detail. Uh, he steps out and says, I am in charge of this unit. 
please allow us to go to the hospital, hand him his card simultaneously, and we'll settle this there. And the officer went off. I want to talk to the driver, and the driver was white. And the guy, it just went, it escalated to the point where the trooper tried to arrest the EMT. And now, relatives <laughs> of, this is a true American scene, relatives of the woman who had had the heat stroke at a family gathering caught up with them and filmed the whole thing or much of it. And one of them called the police. <laughs> because after all, you hear the siren and another officer shows up. And finally, this thing comes to conclusion. But you see, the officer expected, oh, the guy in charge, the, the officer kept telling the guy, the EMT, you um, get back in that. He was determined to talk to the driver, who was the white subordinate. <coughs> and he got profane. And he got obscene. And then he got violent, because the EMT held his position. And then there was a shot scuffle, and then the ambulance began to rock. And then the patient began to scream. It was surreal. It was surreal. Fortunately, the police arrived and help to calm the situation. That's dominance and deference ritual sort of in its extreme form. But the basic form of it is the one I told you, you're supposed to get off, you're supposed to get off the road. And its complexity is the complexity of everyday day life. <coughs> this, I'm giving examples of the kind of ritual. Now, <coughs> Uh, in everyday doing, visible things like all, like any of the rituals I've talked about, come into view as things done. And yet they're thought of as having natural causes being built into the bodily makeup of somebody. So it's as though the rules and rituals of segregation are sufficient to make race visible. You know, the segregation occurs, the dominance ritual occurs, but not, not enough to make it real. And it's along that way that blood, though ordinarily invisible, takes on a peculiar role and script that calls for an extravagance of light. Because blood seems to be and is a natural substance with, a natural, uh, with natural features in the way it operates. But it's also a symbolic substance. It's one of the residences of soul and one of the chief metaphors of race. So interesting things happen. And Here's one of them. Uh, in the United States, well, first of all, transfusion in its modern form, meaning with knowledge of um, natural blood, um, began in the 19th century, but a uh, <coughs> chemist named Carl Landsteiner cracked the mystery of why some people did not get better or die as a result of blood transfusion, and others lived. Now, the assumption similar to that uh, uh, is what you'd expect if people were thinking in the traditional way, I belong in the metaphorical way. My blood is, is the blood of whatever the nation is, or at least what the family is. People assume that a family member was the best donor of blood. Well, family members got killed by the blood of their. Um, family member, until it was discovered that blood had moving parts of its own. And blood had to be matched accordingly if people were going to get benefit from transfusion. That's for that, Carl Weinstein Steiner won the Nobel Prize. 
But as soon as that happened, there's, we tell the whole story here, and I've, I mean much of the story, I won't tell all of it. As soon as that happened, people said, well, wait, wait, we already know about what, and it's not just that. So they began to classify, uh, Landsteiner had identified types A and B, and people began to say, what nation is associated with A? Well, that's the best. And German uh, scientists said type A discovered that statistically type A blood was um, generally distributed among people of the Nordic or Teutonic race. And type B blood was marker of an Eastern or Asiatic origin. That's what they thought. They took the science. It's, it's like a, mixed, a kind of religion in which you mix in part of it and not all of it, and you get a mess. So they, but they did that because they were committed to doing science, but at the same time committed to, uh, they had a strong sense of race and, and racism at the time. So that went on. Meanwhile, in the United States, people were doing the same thing in the 1930s, looking for distinguishing blood factors of black people or of Jews or of other groups. And you could find them advertised in the Journal of the American Medical Association as much as anywhere else. This is, I'm not talking about the wacky fringe. I'm talking about very serious people, as Paul Krugman says. All right, so that was going on. Now comes a trial. Oh. Another step. In 1935, the Nazis um, enacted the Nuremberg Blood Laws, and it was against the mixing of blood, uh, which they thought of as through marriage or um, illicit sex. It didn't occur to them to think about transfusion when they were writing those. So a, a case, a test case, immediately came up, where a Jewish doctor gave his own blood to some to an uh, Aryan is the term that they were using by then, and gave his own blood to an Aryan. The Aryan survived. He did it on an emergency basis. But now the Jew was charged under the Nuremberg Laws. His name was Sans Hans Her Serumen, found guilty of mixing the blood and sent to a concentration camp from which he escaped. But but that's what happened. And people said, well, wait a minute. The law doesn't talk about this, but this needs to be there. And an expert came forward to explain the truth of the matter. And people, long story short, nobody believed that. They weren't prepared to have blood mixing like that. So you had to, to donate blood through all that period through the war in Germany. You had to be able to prove your Aryan descent. Meanwhile, in the United States, there was a call for giving blood uh, as early as 1940. The Red Cross set itself up to do that. And the Red Cross uh, staff included an Afro-American doctor from Howard University named Charles Drew, who was at that point the leading expert on blood storage. And he worked with someone, a, a, a surgeon at Columbia. John C. Scudder uh, in developing a blood bank in a hurry. And the call went out to people to, to uh, give blood to help the victims of the London Blitz. So people were going, and, and Afro-Americans were going to donate blood, and a drumbeat began in the country. Wait a minute, it's not right to be sending black blood over there to our kith and kin in England. And there was so much pressure that the government stopped doing that. Think of it. Just imagine. It's, it's wild. Then they, uh, but this now came, uh, the other side of it was that Afro-Americans said, you called for Americans to make donations. We <coughs> are Americans. You must allow us to donate. So it was one of the early rounds of the civil rights movement, that thing that happened in um, in 1940. 
And they won, in a sense, the government, the War Department said the judgments um, are not scientifically convincing, biologically convincing, the reason for segregating blood, but are psychologically important in America. And those grounds, they allowed black people to give blood, but to give it, but blood had to be separated, segregated. And so the, on top of the logistics of collecting and storing blood, they had to have separate refrigerators. You read about separate shelves in refrigerators, separate days for collecting blood, separate uh, batches uh, for uh, extracting plasma. It, and here, uh, 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 this is 20th century United States supposedly scientific, but this was, this was actually done. And Red Cross was the main actor <coughs> in it. And the, it was in 1950 that the Red Cross backed away from that. In 1960, it was revived, the idea of segregating blood. And this time, it was patients do better if they have blood. It was called unto each his own. Patients do better if they have blood from their own race or ethnic group. And guess who um, put that forward? John C. Scudder, the partner of, of, of Charles R. Drew. And he wrote up, he made, made a presentation, not in scientific journals, but at an annual convention of blood bankers. And he had an interview with the New York Times. So before anybody knew it, blood, blood between different Races was going to be in transfusion was dangerous. It was better for segregation. So they had moved up from the segregation argument. Now, people at Howard University, where Drew was and where he had colleagues, said, Hold it, we want to see the science. And so he invited the man to present his paper to a symposium, and the people at Howard invited people at Columbia to come and examine the work. And boy, that was telling. The guy, the guy said what he could, but basically the logic went like this, uh, because it was based on two types, uh, on two cases. One was an, um, a white veteran who needed open heart surgery and who had transfusion explore for exploratory surgery ahead of it. And the other case was that of a black Canadian woman who had sickle cell anemia and after 15 years or so of treatment with transfusion in Ottawa, Canada, which is at the time had very few black people, she began to have uh, um, immune reactions to the blood of donors. So he said, see, this woman, uh, this person uh, was harmed by having such a transfusion, and this person was harmed by having such a transfusion. And then they proceeded to examine it, and the logic he used was, that Scudder used was, uh, hold your hats, uh, <laughs> that the factor that seemed to have caused the problem is differently distributed between black and white people. Are you ready? 70% of, uh, of white people will have it, and 93% of black people will have it. And so it's quite clear, it was clear in his mind, that the explanation of the distress that happened to the uh, heart patient what came from black blood. But they, <laughs> one of the people said, well, look, he had, he had 70, almost eight chances in 10 of getting it from a white donor. So that wasn't the right division to be doing, you see. And the woman, in the, her case, it was 24% and 76%. She had one chance in four of getting the wrong factor in, um, from a black donor. And she had never had the reaction before. Now, there we see. The, the causality of the witch's flying broom. They, the uh, author of that paper for, 
forgot for all <coughs> intents and purposes, or ignored for all intents and purposes, what a scientifically constructed chain of explanation would give. He assumed the he assumed what he needed to prove that the any racial mixing was dangerous, and therefore these the diff, these uh, statistics weren't fundamental to his uh, explanation. Enough said about that. I'll simply tell you that in 1990, uh, uh, um, oh, in, 19, in 2010, I got a letter from the Washington, from the uh, uh, Red Cross in Atlanta, calling on on black people from the Atlanta University Center to donate blood because that is best for black patients who have an illicit di diseases of which sickle cell was the first was the first in the list. And I immediately called, uh, wrote to the National Red Cross to say, show us the new science that allows you to say that. Mm -hmm. And they sent a, a paper that was published in 1990, this is 2010. My daughter said, it's suspect right on its face if they're using something that old. And, but it was New England Journal of Medicine. And it was about the ill consequences of, quote, racially unmatched blood. And exactly the same logic with the same flaws was there, except it was sickle cell anemia in this case. Sickle cell anemia. Um, a minority of people have sickle cell trait. A minority of people with sickle cell trait have, a minority of, of Afro-Americans have sickle cell trait. A minority of those have um, sickle cell disease. So we have a minority of a minority who are subject to sickle cell in the first place. But this is the basis of a case for segregating, uh, for using racially matched blood. There are other aspects of it that are terrible too, but I think that's enough to make the point that the fact that one is living in a scientifically literate society or shall we say, a society that's sympathetic to science, because not everybody is scientifically rigorous, that we think of ourselves as a scientific society. <coughs> it should not be assumed that really ancient ways of thinking about things like blood still prevail, and really deep flaws of logic that are built in with social life uh, don't disappear because social life requires, a social life depends on conceptualizing things that are invisible. And things that are invisible can't disappear because they don't appear in the first place. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to call on people yourself this time or do you want a host to Relieve you of the responsibility. Relieve me of the responsibility. Thank you. Let me ask a question first, then, since I, then I, then I don't have to. Then I don't have to worry about being able to sneak in. Um, first, just a co an observation, and then a, a comment. I, another example you might use is that the first uh, successful heart transplant in South Africa Aha. was a black an African heart into a white patient, yes. and it created in South Africa at the time a big discussion on just this sort of yeah. issue in the apartheid era. So, Well, it's two types, isn't it? The, there was two, I remember that discussion. One was they experimented. They didn't do all they could to save the, uh, the color oh, whose heart it came from. It was body snatching. <laughs> and the other part was that how could you be putting a, an organ like that from a, into a person of different race? Uh, the, the question I had was this. The example, when you talked about race and scare quotes. Uh-huh. Scare quotes. Well, that's, <laughs> that's not there. Some, sometimes it's, it, that kind of use of quotation is called. Okay. I don't think it's scare like in Halloween. <laughs> <now. laughs> but that, that, that adds to the uh, witchcraft. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so it's only when the faith in rich in race craft is deteriorating that people start doing that. 
That is, in the heyday, yes. Yes. people wouldn't have done that. Yes. It's only when the faith is being eroded that people feel the need to put it in quotes. Whereas, so the, 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 quite, the parallel with the Martin Luther era <coughs> witchcraft artifacts being something that people would shun, they would shun it because they believed it. Whereas people put race in quotes that way because they no longer believe it in the same way that they would have in the Jim Crow era, for example. So it's, I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a, a slightly different thing going on in an era where the faith is under threat from when it's just taken for granted. Yes, I, I, I think that's true. Um, but I also, um, I also would say that look, the things we're talking about, oh, any child would doubt them. I don't know that doubt was rare. It's thus that you learn to stop asking. I brought this book to show you. It's the, about the uh, textbook for lawyers and others used to, uh, that was, was uh, the thing to use in witchcraft trials. And uh, they, it doesn't assume universal belief. It, it forms universal institutional practice where you can be held in for um, things you didn't do. So there was doubt then. Uh, and we have the scare quotes now, but I look at I look at this blood work, and I look at this race-specific medicine. I didn't tell you the story about that I saw <coughs> in a tiny article in the Washington Times about a couple of researchers who uh, were the victims of a whistleblower who revealed that they had gone from the VA hospital in New Mexico uh, to Juarez to collect blood samples from people in a bar they knew about. They were involved in a Latino genetic study and they wanted samples and they got, they were paying $25 a piece for samples and they brought them back and I uh, the article, when the article appeared, that study had been shut down. But I said, I have my ear to the ground because we're going to hear about some kind of race-specific medicine for Hispanic people. Now, with this, I'm sure to ex I expect to find the same kind of logic I'm talking about. The race-specific drug for Afro-Americans, Bidil, uh, B-I-D-I-L, was approved by the FDA for use in Afro-American patients with heart failure based on research that studied only Afro-American patients. Can you imagine? Where was their control, control, control? And who was the advisor who said that passed? But look at the consequence. Now that is, now that the FDA um, approved that as best practice. Those people who did that research stand to make a mint because your doctor won't be able to give you the equivalent. And the equivalent existed in the form of two other medicines that had expired pay, patents, put these together and patented the combination. And that was that. Now, that, we don't, I, I, nothing I said, um, pushes on you the idea that race crap comes out of superstition. It comes out of knowing how to navigate to make money in this case. And if you read the book, you see that the uh, drug, uh, the drug <coughs> selling in a certain, in an Illinois penitentiary <coughs> about is organized by race. There's a, there's a Latin one and there's, let's see, there's, there are two Latin races, one for locally born and one for born, else, uh, born in Mexico. There's one for people called Woods, that's short for Pekka Wood, and that involves skinheads and uh, uh, Aryan Brotherhood people. There are chiefs, those are the Native Americans. They're all races, they're all segregated. All the drug selling is segregated in prison, among other things, and that's part of it. So, um, so it's not fear, it's not belief. I don't know if they believe it or not. 
But I do know that they know the ritual. They know how to step in on the classification. They, they, it's homemade. It's prison made. They've done a, what do you call that? A, a mutant form of the external world system. And it's valid, and it holds up against supposedly a, a higher authority. I saw some of you, yes. Um, thank you so much for this, this talk. Um, you, you said that you had a story that if you got, you would say and, and tell them the questions, I'm not sure if it was about sumptuary laws or different. It was sum sumptuary. Well, you, would you tell it? Some dessert. Okay, if I've answered questions. Oh, no, okay. I'm sure there's more. Okay, so I'm willing to do it if you want to hear. This is uh, Lemon Swamp and Other Places, a book that I wrote with my grandmother. Uh, we published it in 1982. And we put together stories of things that happened to her. And I like it, and people use it in classes because it gives you the fine texture of rituals in the Jim Crow South. But seen from the other side, from the black side of the color line, she had, uh, her people came from central um, South Carolina, a place called I, um, Earhart, of Earhart, South Carolina. And they, her cousin Marie uh, was a fancy dressing woman. She was a widow and was looking for a husband. Uh, so that's who it is. And their, her mother was Carrie. I'm introducing the characters. And, and Mamie is visiting the cousin, the city girl, the city cousin who lives in Charleston who comes up to spend time with them. So she said, um, some t they like to ride around in that buggy and had two horses that were shiny and new. She said, sometimes it wouldn't do to ride around and let the white people see you with your fine things. I found out one day on a visit to a place near Earhart we had gone over to spend the day with my aunt Carrie Garvin. Aunt Carrie was Uncle Billy's widow, but she had a nice farm with a flour mill on it and was well-to-do enough to have a plenty of clothes, and especially the hats that she was known for. How those hats could be. Being a widow, she tried to attract. You could see Carrie coming into the church on Sundays in great big fancy hats and dresses nicer than those many women had. A high flyer, as we used to say. She always arrived late, of course, so the heads turned in pews. Whenever we went over to her house, the girls had a wonderful time dressing up in those things. But one day we thought of something different to do. I always liked to crochet, and since my young cousins didn't know how, I decided to go down to the little town. They tried to tell me, let's don't go to the town. I didn't see why not, and oh, how I wanted to try. They were afraid to go, but didn't tell me. We got Aunt Carrie's buggy, which was a fancy little thing with double horses. This particular day, I drove those horses right into Earhart and straight to the general store. People knew you in a town like that back then and knew who your people were. And if anybody rode in town, they noticed. Well, those crackers looked at us and got kind of mad and called for my husband. Marie, what's the matter with you? My cousin didn't say a word. We went on to the store to a woman called Ruth. Ruth looked a while and said, where are you coming from? You know how some of those folks talk. She said, I come from Charleston. Mm -hmm. Ruth began to look again the way they would do you, taking their time and knowing they got the right to stay. She squinted like a far-sighted person standing too close to see something near. That told you to stand back. So Marie and I stood there quiet, waiting for Ruth. Well, why aren't you out there in the field picking cotton? She wanted to know. So much cotton to pick. <laughs> I don't know how to pick cotton, said my grandmother. We don't have cotton where I come from. I like to pick cotton and have fun here. But I came down to the store for a crochet needle. Silence a while and still squinting. A crochet needle? Who crocheted? She said, surprised to find somebody know how to crochet, I guess. Oh, they were begrudgeful, some of those people. 
They didn't like to see a colored child know about crochet. It was too refined. I do, I crochet, answered. I answered Ruth. My cousin kept quiet. By then it was cousin Mamie, that's Graham, doing all the talking. Oh Lord, here I was, the nomadist Charleston cousin trying to tell this Ruth, Miss Ruth, you know, about a crochet needle. Standing there in my city fire dress and just got down from that two horse blue buggy. The crackers didn't like it and Ruth was gone. It wasn't just the needle that got Ruth's goat. Those folks didn't want you to come down in the weekday at all. They wanted you to come on Saturday, as I came to know later. See, in their heart, they even segregated the days of the week. So riding to the store the way we did was almost the same as if we walked in the diner and sat down for lunch. Saturday was the day all the black people were supposed to go and shop. And oh my, the traffic was heavy. All the horses and wagons and double wagons carrying the Negroes came in all at one time. Really, certain whites didn't like to sink. You had leisure to do anything but sit top and work in the field. Even the children weren't supposed to have leisure. That's one reason why the Negro children had only a two-month school while the others had seven months, and it started after picking. Many black grown-ups were supposed to work every year for this or that person. Just generally, if you were black, you were not supposed either to have either time or money. If you did, you ought not to show it. There were what we called bad crackers in Earhart, who had the reputation of enforcing that sometimes. But then I didn't know enough that particular day to be afraid. I thought we could just go down and get the things from crochet. A crochet needle would sit there, and she stopped staring at us and began to look all about for this needle, poking at this and digging in that, which is amusing when I think about it now, and after a while saying, we don't sell that kind of thing in here. What's amusing is why did she search for the needle? <laughs> I don't know if she truly didn't have fun and wasn't sure she wanted this Charleston colored girl to know it, or she had one and just couldn't make up her mind to sell it to me. Some of them did think colored people wanted to have a certain nice thing, even if they had money enough to buy it. Our people used to send off for certain items that way too, the crackers, or as we say, the pole buckler, as was sometimes the word wouldn't know what you had in your house. So that Time for some more questions. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the soul. You used words like uh, the soul is immaterial, but it can spread contagiously. I don't know what that means. Uh, you used the word contagiousness of soul. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when uh, we identify people racially, used we identify people racially, does that mean uh, you also identify or imply that they have a different soul. Is there such a thing as a black soul and a white soul? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I can tell you that when soul um, is understood to be in blood. What does that mean? The Meaning soul is in blood. blood. What does that mean? Blood is the soul seen from outside. When people use blood as a metaphor, or is that your definition? No. Because I've been studying, you used, you are there, I've been studying the Greeks, and yes. so on. Is that your definition of a soul? Where, how did you come to that definition? I came to that definition from Durkheim, who... Well, Durkheim, he said he drew from, I don't think he understood probably, uh, if he drew from Aristotle or, 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 or Plato, because they don't use those terms about the soul. They don't use terms indissoluble. Blood, blood, and so on. No, no, no. He used those terms to, to account for the behavior of blood, the use of blood symbolically, because there, blood, blood is not that way either. It's just that it's used symbolically to uh, affirm kinship between people. And but that's, that has to do with the soul. It is a mental... You can have a religious soul that's sacred and off from this discussion. But on the discussion Durkheim is trying to have, it's that, it's that the idea of soul is a hugely important mental tool that humans have, have with which to make sense of, to create likeness 
But and the soul is cultivated. You are not born with a soul. I mean, the soul is also... No, 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 I didn't mean that. Oh. Is, no, no. You, you educate the soul, in other words. Did he mean that you are born with a soul and the soul behaves that way all the time? No. If he meant that, he's wrong. The soul is cultivated. We, we use the term, the paideia of the soul. Are you Greek? Are you speaking? Yes, very uh, okay, Greek. Okay, very good. <laughs> Then maybe you and, can and, identify and, yes, that. And because... I'm concerned about the soul now because uh, uh, in our educational system, we don't emphasize the idea of the soul. We, we, we try to deal more the mind, the, the cognitive part, and not the moral and aesthetic part, which is the identity of the soul. And the other question, do you think there are different, the, 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 the uh, Negroes, the blacks, the African Americans, have a different soul from the whites? I think that's... Did you imply that? I think that it is, to speak of a race at all, to speak of black people as being the same, you need a, a concept like that. Otherwise, people would have accepted Walter White as a white man because he looks like it, and uh, his mother, perhaps as a black woman unrelated to one another because she may well have been dark skinned, I, I don't know. But you understand, to be able to say they are the same even though they appear to be different. But do they have different souls? I'm asking the question. They have the do same souls. Do you think soul. that the blacks have different souls from the whites? I'm saying that to speak of black and white races is to say that in effect. And it's used metaphorically all the time when people say, I have black blood, I have white blood. And they do. If you listen to how Americans talk, I have Indian blood. They talk that way. And insofar as blood <coughs> makes soul visible as the inner, most deep part. Now, you have to go with me to Leviticus to say uh, and agree with me that blood is the thing that stands for life and, and from very ancient times. It, it, is the, it is the life of the creature. So defined. This is a discussion of culturally constructed ideas, not of some religious reality that might exist independently of one's no. culture. So I, I'm but not, I'm appreciating the distinction yeah. he drew between mind cognitive and um, aesthetic and moral faculties. But then you, for me, that's grist for my will because you've got yet more invisible things to take account of. You see, I had Socrates visit Obama recently, yeah. President Obama. Socrates visited Yeah, Socrates Obama. visited President Obama and he didn't look at him as an African-American. He you mean Socrates, him as a human being. Socrates revived from the No, dead. no, I, I, I construct the visit of Socrates uh, oh. uh, with, with Obama. I see. Because I, I, I argue about... Let's, I see. Let's see if there's other people of have comments. He didn't look at him as, as, as African-American. He looked at him as a human being. Yes. He had the soul the same as he had. Yes. Good. I agree with that. Other, other questions? We have a few more minutes, and then, of course, tomorrow's open discussion. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm wondering, one of the things that you didn't talk about today, and I know you've, you've written about it in, in, in your work on the current, is that are the dynamics of the pollution and the sacred. Uh-huh. And it's a big, it's a large area, obviously, but I'm wondering how much these, how much the construction of these boundaries, the, the mixing of soul, the segregation of soul, the attribution of, of, of characteristics of race to blood, for example, mm -hmm. are related to a kind of invisible dynamics of pollution. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely, that, that's related. And that, that those dynamics of pollution are themselves a kind of, almost the, the mode by which this invisibility, these invisible boundaries reproduce themselves. Oh, yeah, because they don't have like, something that's invisible and immaterial doesn't need boundaries. You need the invisible thing, so you have to do boundaries. That's, that's what's amazing about trying to keep up with it when people are doing it 
they learn to do it by the half time they're pretty young children. The pollution thing, of course, is very there in the race mix. <coughs> and there's a theory that there was a theory in the 19th century that the, the offspring of, of mixed race would be crazy or uh, you know, otherwise degenerate. And I was saying to the group yesterday that I found myself on a long train ride next to someone from Bosnia. And she told me that there's stories like that circulating now about in her area about mixed marriages, meaning with marriages between um, Orthodox and Catholic people. Their offspring are said to get go crazy and be degenerate. So boundary making is necessary, but look what the material is. There is no inherent boundary when something is immaterial and invisible. And so you can expect something wild to go on when you're making the thing that's invisible and making it bounded off from something else that is. And I think that's a way to account for a lot of, of behavior. It can't be circumvented for humans because we don't have the instinctual structure to do what we have to do. We have to operate symbolically. And it's a mess. <laughs> Do you, know, do you know if there's any um, historical instance of a purification rather than a pollution view? That is, one could imagine a one-drop rule that said one drop of European blood would be sufficient to neutralize, to purify. If you, so is there any ethnic or racial classification which has the same kinds of inequalities, but in which the virtuous component triumphs. Well, I, to is well, the virtuous component. The ones examples I think about are kings in Europe who uh, had offspring, who had bastard offspring with commoners, and there were mechanisms by which they could be given position. And uh, I don't know if it was a purifying. I, I don't, I have to, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Latin uh, America, right, has, I mean, the idea was to whiten out the blood bit by bit through generations, right, to, to, to eliminate more and more blackness from the blood. But, yeah, supposedly that, that, but, you know, any known, and that could come up at any time, could bring it back to zero. This is what happened to, this is what happened to Jews in Germany who had ancestors found in registers, that biological seemingly process of washing it out is enough when the machinery is uh, engaged. I, I, I had a, a follow-up to my question, which is the, the, the sacred, so I, I don't want to put the words in Jeff Alexander's mouth, but I will. Why not? <laughs> uh, so so, so the this, this civil sphere, for example, is a process of repurification. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's raising in the terms maybe, and I, I haven't read the racecraft book, so I want to be careful, but of raising from magic to religion of, 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 of a kind of a sacral, resacralization of an idea that, that we, can, we can purify ourselves from that which divides us. We can, it's ritualistic. It's a kind of higher level purification. It's a resacralization of the idea of what Bella called, of course, American civil religion. Oh, good God. <laughs> so, so, I'm writing on that subject right now for something else. That's why I'm so, reacting. So, I haven't so, read so, that. But, but I mean, if, if we move, if we move, if, if magic or, or racecraft is, is the invisible, we know that racecraft were, as I actually learned from you a long time ago, uh, <laughs> that witchcraft is, is the, is the is invisible action at yeah. a distance, okay. That, but, but we move, we're not stuck within magic. In fact, Durkheim no. himself talks about the movement from magic to religion as a way of moving from the invisible to a form of sacred control of those forces in a kind of purified way. And so it doesn't, I'm, I'm wondering if you've, if you've written about or, or, or thought about or talked about elsewhere how civil religion 
is actually potentially an act of moving above, not beyond, in the sense that that, that, that invisible realm never disappears, but of moving beyond it in a, in a kind of social, uh, social form of purification. I don't know if that makes sense. Or not. I have not thought about that sort of thing. I'm very skeptical of that Bella's concept, civil religion. Because uh, it leaves out too much to start with. You can't be transcending if you if the boat isn't full of the junk, you know. <laughs> so if and I haven't read Alexander's work to know if he has done the necessary critique to what to that old paper of Bella, a brilliant paper for the time and daring, but it has glaring mistakes. It it takes what's good about the United States basically and says it functions as a basis for doing more good. That's what I think, understand Bella's argument to be. But you can't just take what's good when then what's bad flourishes like the green bay tree. You just, you, you can't lift off <laughs> from it and expect to have, I mean, unless you can stay in the craft above it to get the metaphor, you haven't done anything. There was one last question and then we'll wrap up for okay. this afternoon. Craft, more explicit, it offered the potential to transcend it somehow, because people so. could be reflective about it. Yeah. And so I'm going to give you a couple of anecdotes and then ask if you could comment on any examples of how this might be or is being transcended. And the two anecdotes are, um, years ago I was facilitating a, a group in a church, um, probably 98% white, participants in the church and in this group it was an all white group and it was about multicultural relationships and um, attempting to you know live in a, in a way that was more consistent with the teachings of the church about loving and so forth um, and so the point I wanted to bring out was the members many members of the group said um, they knew that somehow growing up they became afraid of other races, um, developed some prejudices and so on, but it was never really explicitly taught growing up. And they, they were trying to wonder, so how did this happen? You know, what, was it a, a glance or a look or a subject that just wasn't talked about or what have you? And it seemed like that was pretty much a shared sense among many members in the group. And I could resonate with that. Um, that I think there were some occasions when some prejudicial things happened in my family, but not a lot. But yet you kind of learn this. So that's one anecdote. The next one is, much more recently, I was having a conversation with an African-American staff member on campus here, and we were talking about um, just a whole host of issues about um, race relations and implications for research and so on on the campus. But at one point she said, because we've been talking about race now for quite a while, and one of the reasons we had the conversation, she wanted to know what is sort of a perspective of a white person about these issues. And what she said um, was, uh, in the black community, we talk about race every day. Sure she said, you know, I mean, this, this is a daily subject. And I said, in the white community, and of course, you know, this is from my experience, it's not a topic that comes up very much. And if it does, it's sort of an awkward kind of, topic that doesn't get probed very much. Um, That's fantastic to so, know. So if it's true, and these are just a few anecdotes, yeah. that in the white community the whole way of approaching race is very different than it is yes. say, in the black community, what does that mean for what you're trying to do with racecraft? I mean, does it have a chance to get genuinely addressed in both sides? I think that's an amazing point you bring up because it says that not everybody has to be worried about the subject. It doesn't impinge on everyday life. Well, that was the point I made to her as to why I thought it was yes. approached differently in the white community. So things can be so managed that it impinges on other people's life by living less separately. I have an example. Um, 
it happened with, between me and a friend of mine, and the friend is the great-great-granddaughter of a slaveholder in South Carolina with whom I worked for 10 years on a documentary called Shared History, because we are both of South Carolina roots. And I told her that when we, I got on, she knew it because she had read Lemon Swamp, and because Lemon Swamp borders the plantation her people owned. So my grandmother's father had grown up in the same neighborhood that her, her ancestors came from. And I said, well, this is going to give me the other part of the story in Lemon Swamp. I'm coming because grandma and I used to sit and speculate what white people were thinking on the other side of the color line. If you agree to be open about that, I think this is a great project, and that's what we did. And that's how uh, there were a few other people in it, and that's how we worked together. And when people came out with the, the uh, white privilege thing, as happened once to Cracker Jack, um, I don't mean to use that term, I mean hotshot, what um, uh, uh, you call video directors, came to us. And they were supposed, they were recommended to do the filming, and they were, um, but I was a consultant, and I had been brought in from France to be there as a consultant, and another person had been brought in from Cambridge. And nothing we said there got noticed from those two hot shots. And at one point, and uh, Felicia, that's the name of the descendant of slaveholders, you could see she was getting more and more annoyed with that, and finally she stood up. She's nearly six feet tall. She did like this. She made a noise with her voice, and she t made them shut up. She said, she told them, I have brought these consultants in, and you are not behaving in consistent with that. We don't need you. And that's when the two of us knew that it was safe to work with her. And it was safe to work with her. So last year, she and I said, we're going to do a book together about the making of shared history. And her, one of her cousins, that same family, went, um, let us have, use his um, condo on the sea down near um, Myrtle Beach. And I said, oh, I, mean, I said, Felicia, I wouldn't come in here alone. So I, 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 the Trayvon Martin scene, I'm aware of the danger of that. I said. So I, was t I just gave her a rolling narrative of what it was. And so we walked together. And then one day I said I was going to the pool, and she expected me to go by myself. I said, Felicia. She said, all right, I get you. <laughs> so we sat down, and we talked to people who arrived. And I said, we, may, we did some transgressing of barriers. It may not be the same as it was. But so long as I wasn't without you, I had no idea how to escape the possible consequences of being there. Part of the film project, we, we had a, a weekend retreat up in the plantation house. Because I said, I richly need to get rid of some ghosts. And I have to find out if there's still ghosts up in that place. <laughs> So I did not sleep well, so I was downstairs in the early morning and sitting at the dining room table, and the door opened and in came the quintessential, stereotypic South Carolina, tall, gaunt, hawk-nosed man with his shotgun in the door. Door opens and he comes in, and I jumped. I, he saw it. I didn't get up, but I... I just came to see how y'all are doing. <laughs> that was Cousin Carl. So, you know, <laughs> we, did some, we did some of the kind of work that you can only do if we're not operating uh, in stuff. We have the complicity to consciously go into places now. I have other friends like that to blow away things and getting rid of ghosts. After that encounter with the guy, I, I was able to sleep in the house. And I think at that level, and purification of that sort
sort. And that's not the not, that's the contrary of the civil religion because this is dealing with what was there and what was true. And uh, so. Well, that's a nice note to end. Yeah. I, I hope our meeting do come back tomorrow at twelve twenty and eighty one oh eight. Thank you a lot. Oh, thank you.